Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing factorization of polynomials over a field. Okay, so we've now discussed this theorem uh, concerning when a polynomial from a ring of polynomials over a field is going to have a degree 1 divisor. Okay, and we've used this theorem to understand when a polynomial of degree 2 or degree 3 is going to be reducible and when it's not. Okay, what I now want to do is have a look at another uh, related theorem concerning polynomials in a ring of polynomials over a field. Okay, so this final theorem then that I want to show you is that if you have some polynomial p of x, okay, so let's say we've got p of x here, which is from the ring of polynomials over a field here, so it's from f adjoin x, then this polynomial can have at most n distinct roots um, in the field capital F, where n is the degree of this polynomial. That's the theorem that I now want to discuss. Okay, that follows very naturally from what we've already discussed. Okay, so let's say then that the degree of this polynomial p of x here is little n, okay, so that I don't keep have to write uh, out degree of the polynomial p of x, let's just denote the degree of the polynomial p of x uh, by little n here, uh, then the theorem says that this polynomial p of x can have at most n distinct roots in the field capital F. Now remember a root is an element of the field capital F, okay, we've previously called them uh, alpha, okay, so it's an alpha which is an element of the field such that when you uh, apply the evaluation uh, homomorphism uh, for alpha on the polynomial p of x, the answer is zero. Again, people would more normally write this p evaluated at alpha uh, gives you zero in the field. Okay, so uh, this theorem then says that this polynomial is limited in how many roots it can actually have in the field. Okay, and it's limited to having n. Okay, it cannot have more than n roots in the field. There cannot be n plus 1 alphas, which are different elements of the field, such that they are all roots of this polynomial, i.e. when you apply the evaluation homomorphism for all of them to the polynomial p of x, the answer is 0. Okay, so why is that going to be the case? Okay, well let's firstly take the case where we actually have n distinct roots for our polynomial p of x. And I want to stress, it's not at all uh, given that you will have n distinct roots, okay? You might have none, okay? What this theorem is saying is that you cannot have more than n. You have at the most n uh, roots, okay? for this polynomial when it's in the ring of polynomials over a field. And I want to stress this only applies when we're talking about rings of polynomials over a field, okay? If it's a more general ring, uh, you can't say that this is true. Okay, so, uh, the way then that I want to understand how this is true is let's think about what happens if this polynomial P of X does indeed have N distinct roots in the field capital F, okay? What does that actually allow us to do with this polynomial P of X? Because it actually allows us to factorize the polynomial P of X into uh, a product of loads of degree 1 polynomials. And let me show you the reason for this. So let's firstly just come up with a bit of nomenclature. So let's call our uh, roots alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n here. So let's say these are all elements of the field and each one of these is distinct. So they're all separate elements of the field and they all have the property that they are roots of this polynomial P of X. So uh, when you apply the evaluation homomorphism for each one of these to the polynomial P of X, the answer is zero in the field. When you evaluate the polynomial at these elements, you get zero. Okay, right. So what does this allow us to do? Well, uh, from what we've discussed so far, we know that uh, this means taking the root alpha 1 here that we can write our polynomial p of x. Okay, so we can write our polynomial p of x as some, and I've forgotten to write it again, uh, q of x here times uh, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 1 here, like so. Okay, so it allows us to write our polynomial as this degree 1 polynomial, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 1, which of course will always exist, uh, all elements in the field will have an additive inverse, times some other polynomial, q of x, which we know will have degree n minus 1 because of the uh, formula that is always true in an um, integral domains uh, polynomial ring. Okay, right, uh, so that will have degree n minus 1. 
Now, um, so we've taken our polynomial and we've factorised it into a degree 1 polynomial times the degree n minus 1 polynomial. But I claim that we can go further now. Okay, so let's think about alpha 2 now, this other root of the polynomial p of x. Okay, and what I want to show you is that alpha 2 is now going to be a root of this quotient polynomial q of x. Okay, so let me show you why this is going to be true. So let's apply the evaluation homomorphism uh, for alpha 2 to both sides of this equation. So we can apply it to the polynomial p of x here. Okay, and we can also apply it to the right-hand side of this equation. So we'll get phi uh, sub alpha 2 here. And now we use the fact that the evaluation homomorphism is a ring homomorphism, and therefore is going to be compatible with multiplication. Okay, so this allows me to split it up into q um, of x evaluated at alpha 2. Okay, so the evaluation homomorphism applied to uh, q of x times in the field, because once you've applied the evaluation homomorphism, you are now working in the field. Uh, the evaluation homomorphism for alpha 2 uh, are acting on uh, x. And that, because we're short on space, I will just uh, use the common notation and we'll go to x minus and that should be alpha 1 not alpha 2 I apologize for that okay right now look at this on the left hand side here we know what the answer is we know that the polynomial evaluated at alpha 2 gives us 0 okay so we know that the answer there is 0 in the field now on the right hand side here we can't at the moment initially say much about uh, phi at sub alpha 2 evaluated at q of x, we will be able to say something about that, but we need firstly to evaluate this, okay? So of course, here all you're going to do is replace the x with an alpha 2, and the plus that was here becomes a real plus in the field, okay? So this will now become alpha 2 plus the additive inverse of alpha 1 here. Okay, now we don't know much about that because we don't know much about uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2 apart from the fact that they're roots. Um, but what we can say about this is that it is not 0. When you take alpha 2 and add the additive inverse of alpha 1, you do not get 0. Okay, if you took alpha 1 and added it to its additive inverse, of course you would get 0. But alpha 2 is a distinct root from alpha 1. Okay, uh, so no, this is not going to give 0. So whatever this is, it's not equal to 0. Okay, so that's good. Now we use the fact that all fields are integral domains, okay? Because here I've got an equation that works in the field, capital F, the coefficient field. I've got 0 is equal to whatever this is times something that is not equal to 0. And in an integral domain, you cannot multiply two non-zero elements together and expect to get 0. Okay, so that must mean that this must be 0. Okay, so the polynomial q of x evaluated at alpha 2 must be 0. Okay, and you might think that's rather trivial. You might have thought that was obvious when I initially uh, wrote this down, uh, but it does require proof, and that's the reason it's going to be true, the rigorous reason it's going to be true. So what I have um, just shown you then is that the remaining roots here, alpha 2, alpha 3, all the way up to alpha n, they're all going to be roots of this new polynomial that I've got, q of x here, which of course is going to be an element of the ring of polynomials over my uh, coefficient field, capital F. Okay, and now what that means is that now I can uh, do the exact same thing that as I did with p of x, uh, with q of x, and now I'm using the root alpha 2. So I can now write q of x here as, let's say, some q prime of x, times a degree 1 polynomial, which will have uh, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 2, like so. Okay, uh, and of course, that means that now p of x is going to be q prime of x times x plus the additive inverse of alpha 2 times x plus the additive inverse of alpha 1, like so. So I'll underline that in purple here again. Okay, whoops, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so I'm now gradually developing this factorization into degree 1 polynomials. And now the exact same argument as I applied here for alpha 2 being a root of q of x now applies for all the remaining roots, alpha 3 all the way up to alpha n, for q prime of x. So you can argue the exact same thing here. Okay, so q prime of x is going to have roots alpha 3 all the way up to alpha n. And the other important thing to stress is that what is the degree now of q prime uh, of x? It's going to be n minus 2. Okay, we've now factored out these degree 1 polynomials uh, for two roots, so now the degree of our polynomial here is n minus 2. 
Now you can continue on in this way. You can now factor out uh, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 3, and you can continue on all the way until you do x plus the additive inverse of alpha n. And what will you end up with then as your q prime, 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 however many times of x? Um, well, you will have to end up with a polynomial of degree uh, 0. Okay, because as you can see, generalize the pattern here, as you factor out these degree 1 uh, polynomials here, you're subtracting off here that from the degree, well, the degree of the polynomial that you've got left over is n minus how many you factored out. When we factored out n, it's going to be n minus n, so we're going to end up with a degree 0 polynomial. So what we'll end up doing is reducing our polynomial p of x to some constant, some element of the field, times, and I'll write it, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 1, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 2, all the way up to x plus the additive inverse of alpha n. Okay, like so. So if you have n distinct roots of the polynomial p of x, you can now perform this beautiful factorization in this way. Okay, you can factorize your polynomial p of x out into some constant, which of course will be a unit in the ring of polynomials over the field, okay, times those of degree 1 polynomials, which of course are irreducible. We've already talked about how degree 1 polynomials are irreducible. So here, I have a factorization into irreducibles just with a unit out the front. So this is perfect. If you have n distinct roots, you can factorize your polynomial p of x into a beautiful irreducible factorization in this way. Okay, now, how am I going to use this fact to then prove that you can't have another root? You can't have n plus 1 distinct roots or anything above n. Okay, well, let's imagine if we had an n plus 1 root. So let's say we have now alpha n plus 1 here. Okay, then that means I could now do this process again. But let's say instead of using alpha 1 here, instead I'll use alpha n plus 1 here. Okay, so what I'd be able to do then is forget about alpha 1. Instead, put alpha n plus 1 here. I know alpha 1 is still a root, but if alpha n plus 1 was a root before, I abandoned it when I was performing this factorization here. Okay, so now why don't I just abandon alpha 1 and use alpha n plus 1? Okay, so if there is an alpha n plus 1, and I'm stressing this is a distinct root, okay, it's not equal to any of the others, okay, uh, then what I'll be able to do is perform a similar factorization, and I'll end up with some constant here, let's say c bar, because it's not necessarily the same constant polynomial, okay, and then I'll have x plus the additive inverse of alpha m plus 1 this time, and then all the rest will be exactly the same, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 2, I've still used all of those, and then we'll have x plus the additive inverse of alpha n. Now, what is wrong with that? Well, this is another factorization of this polynomial p of x into uh, irreducibles. Okay, but we know, we know that the ring of polynomials over a field is a unique factorization domain. Okay, so all uh, factorizations into irreducibles have to be equivalent. It has to be the case that I can turn this one into this one just by messing around with associates. So that would mean that this polynomial here, x plus the additive inverse of alpha 1, would have to be the associate of x plus the additive inverse of alpha m plus 1. But what does it mean to be an associate? It means that you times this one by a unit and you get this. Okay? Is there any unit, any constant polynomial in the ring of polynomials over the field that I can multiply this with to turn it into this? Well, the answer is, of course, no, because as soon as you multiply this by some constant polynomial, you'll change the uh, coefficient in front of x away from being 1. Okay, so you can't take this and multiply it by a unit in the ring of polynomials over the field and expect to turn it into this. So these two are not associates, and that means that these two different factorizations into irreducibles are not equivalent. Okay, and that would contradict this being a unique factorization domain. So what I've shown you is that you cannot have n plus 1 um, different, distinct roots of this polynomial p of x, otherwise it would contradict the ring of polynomials over the field being a unique factorization domain. Okay, so a polynomial p of x, which is in a ring of polynomials over a field, can have at most n distinct roots. Now note, I'm not saying that it has to have n distinct roots, okay, I'm saying that at the 
very maximum it can have n distinct roots. It cannot have more than n distinct roots. And a reminder that n is just representing the degree of the polynomial in this discussion. Okay, so uh, we will end this video here, okay, uh, and I hope you learned something.